Hello, everyone. Today I'm with Michael Cornwall, PhD. And Michael is a Jungian therapist who has been specializing in helping clients through extreme states, psychosis, for over 40 years. And Mike's written many uh, papers on this topic, on initiatory madness, on a qualitative study of psychiatric extreme states, many. You've written lots and lots of papers also, Mike, on this area, haven't you? So welcome. Thank you very much, John. It's good to be with you. I've enjoyed our conversations the last few months and, and uh, your podcast, and I'm grateful to be here today. Um, well, you you just said we could just start with me kind of rambling on. Maybe I'll do that a little bit. Yes, do that. And But, I, I, you know, can I just say one thing? When I read Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, and I don't know how you pronounce this word, but when Jung was at the Bergelsi Clinic or uh -huh. um, uh, the psychiatric clinic, one thing that uh, I really liked about that was that where the the standard kind of um, procedure was to race in and diagnose everyone and, you know, oh, such and such is a schizophrenic or something like that. Uh, Jung was into more the getting into the world or or the you know the conversation or he had he had a different kind of approach and I, I admired that about him like his his whole approach was very very different to what seemed like the standard practice at the time. That's very true, and that was. His time there, I think, was the springboard to his, you know, lifelong, uh, you know, immersion in other people's suffering when they were in those extreme states. And then, of course, his own travails that he recorded and were, were uh, lucky to see in the in the red book and, and um, the black books. And, 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 of course, in the memories, dreams and reflections, he talks a lot about his confrontation with the unconscious. So, um, yeah, that's the backdrop of what we're going to be talking about, talking about today. And, oh. and I wanted to uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Well, as I was thinking about this uh, talk with you today, and for your listeners, uh, I know you've interviewed several other people who you know are in the young world, Jungian therapists, and. Uh, authors and um i just wanted to say a little bit about uh what was coming up for me in a preparation for this um mm -hmm. when i was 18 years old uh here in the united states the vietnam war uh, that, that was back in uh, 1976 was really ramping up and um i chose to be trained we could choose which parts of the army we went into that. So I was uh, chose to be a, a, a medical corpsman or a medic. And uh, I was uh, in an army reserve unit for six years. I didn't go to Vietnam, but for those six years as a, as a medic who, you know, um, on maneuvers and uh, different war games and stuff, drove one of those old mash type Jeep field ambulances and yeah. worked in hospitals and was around a lot of men who were uh, injured. Uh, I realized that really set the stage for my later work as, as a therapist, that, that being with people in um, real suffering, emotional suffering and physical suffering and doing that hands-on patient care. And um, it really uh, gave me a sense that when I got into the field of psychology, there was, and to this moment right now, there are no medical tests for these labels that people get put on them of schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, uh, ADHD, schizoaffective, any of that, uh, 
there are no uh, brain scans, no blood tests, no x-rays, no genetic tests. Uh, basically, we're being and have been for decades been asked to take these uh, psychiatrists. Basically, there's 25,000 psychiatrists in the United States, a powerful group. Take their word that they are medical experts on diagnosing and treating people with these powerful and dangerous and life-threatening drugs often based on a uh, kind of a theoretical laundry list of so-called symptoms of behaviors. And uh, as we know, that's all very uh, questionable. I mean, at one point, homosexuality was a disorder that was in the DSM. So mm -hmm. these increasing numbers of ways that our human emotional life gets pathologized has always been a sore point for me coming from that background of being I mean even yeah. now kind of an old man at 77 when I go in and get my blood tests and my skin cancer treatments and everything I want to know that they you know they can do that here's 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 the results of your tests mm -hmm. you know uh, for diabetes for coronary artery disease for cancer I mean we, we rely on people you know being able to say here's we did these scientifically yeah valid uh tests but we we can't offer that for people in this field and so even for Jungians who have a whole other wonderful dimension of, of viewing human nature yeah. we're still in the uh job of helping people to not suffer and die and the horrible truth is that uh the patients in psychiatry and that medical specialty who are treated with these drugs mainly. Yeah. It's, and now it's not just older people, it's toddlers, it's children, it's teens, it's adults. One in four women in the United States are on psychiatric drugs. Almost everyone who gets a diagnosis of some kind of so-called psychotic disorder is putting on these putting on these drugs yeah. and so the horrible truth is that those people uh it's proven die 25 years earlier than the national average so i think it's incumbent on us who are in this field to have that as the backdrop at least it is for me as an old medic is going you know it's all about saving life and relieving suffering and we're in a in a field where these so-called diseases like schizophrenia and bipolar that have no disease process, no one ever died of schizophrenia, no one ever died of bipolar. They die of the uh, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome that's caused by the medication. Yeah. Their lives, okay. their lives are shortened that, that, that cause diabetes. Can, so can I just you, wanted to say that this is probably yeah, an unusual that, intro you, to, you know, no, to that's your, good. Before you, before you get on to, um, you know, your approach and your work and, and how you came to that. And, you know, it strikes me that this is a bit of street language kind of thing, Mike, but it's, it's, there's two big, there's two parts of psychology. You know, you've got this one part that just love the diagnosis. <laughs> They're right into it, you know, and, and, uh, um, and then you've got, you know, a, another side, which, you know, like I remember Jung saying he gave up diagnosis as, he, as as time went on, you know, and there's another side that relies more on other approaches and myth and, you know, and, and but it, it seems to have become so strong, the diagnosis, you know, it's, it's such a strong emphasis. Well, it's, um, it, it's, it's uh, it's monolithic. I mean, in the United States, you know, I've been a licensed therapist for almost 40 years. And part of my also kind of ground level view is comes from working 28 years full time as a psychotherapist in a public mental health system, large public mental health system here. Yeah. Seeing 
people every day for 28 years. Uh, that's kind of a different resume than most Jungian analysts. I'm not a Jungian analyst, but most Jungians, I think I maybe knew in those 28 years, maybe one or two people who had Jungian leanings in the front lines. Yeah. So uh, the, the truth is in the United States, and I don't know what it is in other countries, if your listeners are from there, but if you're a Jungian analyst or a Freudian psychoanalyst or a licensed psychologist or an MF family therapist or psychologist or a clinical social worker, if you work in any public sec se se sector, you have to diagnose everyone that you see. And if you're in private practice and you take any uh, public insurance or private insurance, you have to give everyone you see a diagnosis. You cannot get paid if you don't diagnose if you're taking insurance or you're working in any kind of public sector thing. So this kind of monolithic lock that psychiatry has on is certainly uh, dependent too on the enormous uh, machine around it now. Well, and the machine around it is is the political power, the corporate power of, of the pharm pharma in its industry. Mm. So I've always kind of seen it as an unholy alliance, the, the 25,000 psychiatrists and the, the drug company reps that I've, I, I see, you know, coming in a steady parade into their office with the latest drug and here you need to do this. Uh, at the APA conventions, it's been notorious over the years. It's like a, a lot of stuff has been paid for. They've stopped that lately, but been paid for by the drug companies, all the booze, you know, all the, you know, all the emollients, you know. <laughs> so yeah. you got this, you got this uh, kind of uh, psychiatry and uh, farm industrial complex here. That's got a lock in it. So you can't, any psychiatric emergency, you're going to, your, your loved one's in a crisis. There is no psychiatric emergency. Maybe that Jung would like to have run where, you, where someone goes in and doesn't get diagnosed. Everyone gets diagnosed. Everyone to get paid. So uh, in my 28 years working at the county public sector, uh, that started out, I'll just say a little bit now about that remarkable program that I worked at called iWARD. I wrote an article about it called Remembering a Medication-Free Madness Sanctuary. For a few years, we actually had a ward, a 20-bed ward that was open, no restraints, no medication, based on a lot of the work of, of young, uh, young in John Weir Perry that had a similar one in San Francisco called Diabasis House. We can go into this, some of that later. But anyway, uh, that place... Uh, we didn't medicate anyone, but we had to diagnose them, John. So everyone there, because we didn't believe in the diagnosis, but we had to get paid and keep the doors open. We just diagnosed everyone brief reactive psychosis. So it's kind of in that psychosocial, like the person's reacting to something in your their life. If yeah. we can get them through this crisis, this process, uh, unmedicated in this deep transformative thing they're going through, with under six months, then they, they they can't get labeled schizophrenic. They can't get that label because you have to have those so-called symptoms for six months. So that was the race against the clock. So yeah. to this day, I've never diagnosed anyone with schizophrenia, so-called schizophrenia, bipolar, ADHD, uh, major depression, all these things where they claim there's these biological underpinnings. Uh, you know, there's a chemical imbalance and in uh, depression, that's been proven and debunked in the last few years, to the chagrin of all these drug companies and psychiatrists. It, you know, it, it's not that your brain doesn't have enough serotonin, you know. Uh, so I've never diagnosed anyone with any of those, and I've never referred anyone for medication. So I'm kind of a rebel guy who, yeah. even within the belly, the beast of the, th of the system, if someone wasn't psychotic and they came in to see me, mm. I diagnose all them. Um, the most forgiving of all labels, uh, adjustment disorder with mixed emotional features. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I was I was like this subversive, uh, yeah. dis dissident therapist. Yeah, with my own experience of these extreme states, maybe I could, could start there. Maybe just yeah. Well, I'm, you know, to me, that's the perfect leading to. I, how did you start with this work? You know, a little bit about you. How did you start with this work and, and your approach? 
Yeah, so, um, well, back in the uh, 1960s as a young man, um, I went through one of these experiences myself that was, as we know now, there's a lot of really just clear, wonderful research that people's vulnerability to going into these extreme states or psychotic states is so uh, related and correlated to trauma and loss and neglect. And so my good friend over there in the UK, uh, John Reed, who for the last 30 years has done the main research on uh, the relationship between trauma and uh, psychosis. In fact, he's the editor of the journal Psychosis, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful journal. Um, he came up with the uh, accurate term for, for what happens to us in our, in our childhood that is traumatic and, and can later set us up for going through one of these psychotic passages called uh, adverse experiences of childhood, I think it is, yeah. Adverse experiences of childhood. So looking back on my experience where I went out into that waking nightmare for about a year when I was about uh, 19, I look back into my childhood history and I share these intimate details because I want other people to know that that was my story, but also I've had so much in, uh, response over the years, John, from people when I tell these details, they go, well, yeah, you know, that was me too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing that's happening these days on Mad in America, that website where I've written 51 articles or something. There's so many people who say the, the, the value of, of those of us who's been through this lived experience sharing it. So it's not, you know, some freak show that people get put away forever. And it's like, no, this is just, this is me. It's my brother. It's my mother, you know? So, uh, <clears throat> when I was 18, uh, I was someone who was vulnerable for going into that extreme state process because of some of my childhood experiences. Because when I was a toddler, about 18 months old, I was, I got third degree burns on my left hand, my fingers on a, back then they had these little stove some people in their house where they burned trash it was a red cherry red stove and my hand went on there and I was severely burned and had skin grafts was in the hospital for weeks so that kind of experience I mean we are uh, mammals we are animals we have a body and when trauma hits where there's a burn like that or someone battering us or abusing us or terrorizing us we hold that in all our body and every cell and every uh, neurotransmitter. So anyway, that was a, a huge thing that to this day, I, I still can kind of go back and feel that young vulnerability of, of being uh, hurt so bad. And, yeah. and then also, it was a time of being a baby boomer born in 1946. My father had been in the Air Force and was one of the guys who flew all those missions over Germany, he was a, I think a bombardier, you know, a uh, mm -hmm. young guy from Boise, Idaho, going up and doing that and came back really uh, impaired from yeah. the war. And yeah. uh, so he and my mom weren't together that much. And I never really lived with him. Uh, he, he just went away. And, and then uh, a couple of years later, my mother uh, went away too. And so I was raised by my loving great grandmother and, and grandmother. Uh, so all these early childhood things. Uh, they will affect us. It might... affects us. I mean, my wonderful mother was in the 1940s and 1950s in Boise, Idaho, was a six foot one tall, beautiful <laughs> kind of look like a movie star, Lauren McCall or something. Uh, my last name, I go by Cornwall. That's my adopted name, but that's the name of my mother's fifth husband. So she, <laughs> she was married five times before I was like 10 years old. So all that stuff impinges on someone. Yeah. You know, and uh, 
So then here I am, 18 years old. All my friends are wanting, they're going in the Marines. They want to go over, you know, kind of kill a commie for Christ in Vietnam. Yeah. I'm this kind of sensitive, <laughs> introverted kid. I don't want to go yeah. kill or be killed for some old man's war in Vietnam. Bless yeah. all those people who served. <clears throat> I respect them, but that wasn't my path. So that was weighing on me, that whole kind of ostracization. The time was so, uh, such an upheaval in itself, apart from yeah. any family environment and all of that. I mean, yeah. everything was in the air, wasn't it? It was. And so all those factors, the the cultural, the social things that are going on, just like this pandemic, there's going to, the five years from now, when they write some of the research on that, they're going to see enormous kind of impacts on people's uh, emotions and suffering and addiction. Yeah. We're already seeing that. Yeah. Uh, so all that was going impinging on me. I was uh, wanting, I was, even then I'd, uh, I'd been through, uh, I had, I'd, I'd already been through the basic training and gone through my, my medic training. So I was kind of situated to, I was going to go into to pre-med in college. I was going to try and be a doctor. I, I had my life kind of moving in that direction and I probably wouldn't have gone uh, down the rabbit hole not to make light of it, it was hell. I went into the hell hole yeah. of this extreme state if it wasn't for a fateful encounter with uh, LSD. And that was the set and the setting of that mm. was was very traumatic. Let me just say something quick about John Reed's <laughs> research about summing all this up about what can bring a life into this collapse and possible possible change uh in these trainings and workshops i've done over the years at Essel and everything when i'm talking about how this happens i yeah. often say this happened that happened it's like you're being a detective it's like you're columbo going what are the clues that you find out well this happened that was traumatic that was hellish then this over here needed to happen that loving care that loving kind of merciful being the delight the apple of your eye of one of your so this happened this happened this didn't happen then this needed to happen then this didn't happen then this happened and all of a sudden a person is overwhelmed so john yeah. reed this distinguished worldwide recognized uh yeah. researcher was at this big conference and part of it was honoring him and he's up there on stage hundreds of people there and he comes back comes out and he says uh so before I get into all the details of my life's work about the, the psychosocial causes and trauma, trauma, trauma causes of psychosis, I just want to say one thing. Bad things happen and they fuck you up. God bless him for saying that. I mean, anybody can understand that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think gets lost. In fact, I wrote an article really nailing this where it says the title of my article is what's wrong with you nothing what's happened to you something so that flies in the face of the whole disease model of psychiatry that says we're not really that interested in what's happened to you mm. or what the situation was in your country or your neighborhood or your mm. economic or you know poverty sexual we, we just want to say we've got this must we've be, got the fix we, we, we've got not only yeah we, we we can tell you i mean i've been in rooms countless times i mean for, during those 28 years working in the county every day john i was on a treatment team with a psychiatrist some of the most mm -hmm. wonderful people in the world some of my dear friends yeah but they had gone to med school they'd had the training they'd invested their life in it they had this full kind of guild support of the 25,000 other psychiatrists and a huge incentive to be able to make, especially the last 20 years or so, as much as a cardiologist. Mm. I think the average uh, income of a psychiatrist in the United States now is over $200,000, if not more. So mm. being there every day and sometimes being in a room with someone I was helping who was in a psychotic episode and their parents had been kind of heard, well, he's got to be medicated, got to be medicated. I couldn't yeah. tell the parents, no, you, no, you can't get him 
uh, assessed by the psychiatrist. But when that assessment happened, I would go in and sit with, say, the young man or woman and the psychiatrist and the parent. And the psychiatrist would be sitting with a computer like this with a checklist, the person sitting over the side or sometimes even behind them. And the psychiatrist wasn't even turning around and looking at him. This is, well, da, 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 how many did this happen and this and do you have this? And then finally, they kind of turn around and said, well, uh, you've, you've qualified for this schizophrenia diagnosis and you'll have it for the rest of your life. You'll need want to tell your mother you'll need to be on medication for the rest of your life. It's like diabetes. I remember one guy was sitting there and he starts rocking going forever, forever, forever. And I stepped in and I said, well, I disagree with that doctor. Uh, I've worked with a lot of these young men and who have a lot going on and uh, we can work on his emotional experience. And I, I'm, I'm not in agreement that this is a forever thing. I've seen a lot of people come through this. Yeah. Uh, of course, I got you, the death, you, death stare guy, from the psychiatrist. Didn't but, go over that well, I would imagine. Uh, no, it didn't, but I didn't care because there again, <laughs> back to the old U.S. Army, and I'm 18 years old, and this person's, this officer's looming over me going, Private Cornwall, if we go into combat, you are responsible for these men's lives. Do you understand me? I go, <laughs> sir, yes, sir. And he go, you better know what you're doing with that medical kit, son. I'm going, yes, sir, yes, sir. So, you know, some psychiatrist <laughs> glaring at me, not bothered. I think yeah. that's part of it, too. Being uh, in that system for 28 years, especially with that wonderful beginning on iWork where people could go through this experience without medication, you just have this sense that I've got to be uh, an advocate for yeah. what I know is true. And, uh, and Michael, if I can just enter in there for a second, I, I was reading one of your articles <clears throat> this morning about Diabasis House or Diabasis House, and the thing that struck me, which is so obvious too, is the initiatory. What is it? Um, how how an episode can also be an initiatory event in someone's life? Mm -hmm. Like you, you were talking about some. Uh, I there was one person who was meant to be a a lawyer, and in a sense, uh, uh, a kind of an episode in her life got her closer to her real calling, we could say, or whatever, you know, where she was really meant to go, or the shamans of old that had episodes that called them deeper, if you know, I'm putting it in shorthand language and and all of that. That's, but, that's very true, and maybe I can focus on that now, some the how the diabetes worked and even back up some, some to my own experience after I had that traumatic encounter, you know, yeah. that built up over my life. It kind of set me up and then took the fateful LSD experience. I went, I went into, again, the, the, the kind of shamanistic model is there's the underworld, the middle world, and the upper world. Yeah. Quite a few people, when they go into these experiences, they shoot right up into the upper world and they have this kind of ecstatic uh, experience. Uh, the world is one or whatever. Yeah, it's one and it's it's beautiful and they're, they're in touch with all the angels and it, it's kind of a messianic thing. Sometimes yeah. they come back down into the middle world. Sometimes, most of the time, people who go up come down too. But yeah. my experience was going right down into the the underworld realm. And mm -hmm. I just want to read a quote here now by Young because I think there's some uh, trepidation on a lot of therapist points, and, and even even Jungians who think that the uh, the only forces that we really have to contend with that are the most powerful and disorienting are archetypal forces. Uh, but Jung was pretty clear. Mm. Uh, that he believed there was a kind of a, a basement below the archetypal uh, experiences. So this, uh, he wrote, uh, the uh, in the mythology of earlier times, these forces were called mana or spirits, demons, or gods. They are as active today as they ever were. The one thing we refuse to admit is that we're dependent on 
powers, quote, powers that are beyond our control. Uh, and he also said that psychiatry has turned the gods into diseases, curious specimens for the consulting room. So I was just talking to a Jungian analyst a few days ago who was seeing a client who actually was experiencing some uncanny things. And Jung certainly had some uncanny experiences in the memory, dreams, and reflections where he walked into the room and he said there was a spirits of a dead filling the whole room to the ceiling and they were crying out, we have come back from Jerusalem where we found not where we what we sought. So these experiences can be very powerful and yeah. uh, say the least. So when I was down in that realm yeah. and couldn't sleep and I was being assaulted by these I'll just call them forces like he did. Uh, mm. I think it uh, it diminishes some of it for the Jungians to kind of say, well, uh, it's archetypal phenomenon. Jung was not afraid to call these forces. Some of them archetypal phenomenon are, are autonomous too. But yeah. there's another level of uh, the world of experience, experience that, that, that it's very, very well known as just kind of in the air uh, of uh, so-called traditional cultures. You can go to many Native American healers now, and that's what, I mean, there's this wonderful guy, Louis uh, Mehe Madrona. Uh, he's a Native uh, psychologist, and he, he just comes out right and talks about it. He says, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and you go to these Indian uh, Native American communities and the people who are really doing this this healing they're they're dealing with powerful forces that's scary that kind of flies in the faces you know of our even our kind of Jungian understanding that uh, well we can contain this in my with private the with the strong ego or something yeah, and we can contain this maybe in my private analyst practice here. And if someone really gets into it, well, anyway, I'm just putting that out also as a caveat. So when I went through this, it went on and on. And it was like I was being uh, tortured in a way. And uh, I had my loving grandmother there who was in her 80s at that time. I was living alone with her. She was like this person who provided me this sanctuary and this is what really was the start of my own work for the last 50 years is that yeah. that what really helps whether you're in these extreme states or if you're suicidal or if you're suffering loss grief and you just can't come out of that hell that you're in to have someone there who gives what I call merciful love. I wrote an article uh, recently. It was called Merciful Love Can Help Relieve the Suffering of Extreme States. And I thought long and hard about using that word merciful love, but it really is that. It's that quality of love when we're hurting so much where we're willing to just cry out, help me, help me. At, that, mm -hmm. at, that, at those times, when help comes, it does feel merciful. So I would be with her. Sometimes I would be kind of raving and hearing voices and seeing things and feeling all this stuff. And I'd sit on the floor beside her, John, like I had when I was a little boy. Yeah. When I had the flu or something and I was sick, she raised me and she'd put her hand on my forehead. I'd ask her, Grandma, put your hand on my forehead, head, please. And put, she'd put her hand on my head and she'd just sit, hold her hand there. And she didn't go, well, what is wrong with you? You know, to go need to go see a doctor. What the heck? She just <laughs> sat there. She didn't ask me anything. It was just like, yeah. Michael, here's suffering. At one point she said, there, there, dear. I think you have the flu, Michael. You'll be better soon. And I didn't tell her, Grandma, I don't have the flu. <laughs> but there, there was that loving presence. And that's a lot of what, over the last 40 years, I try and almost channel her, where I can be with someone without grilling them and thinking about them and these even Jungian terms, just be there like another person, like you would be with your beloved 
son or daughter or partner, just be there, not asking a bunch of questions, just present with your heart open. That's what I try and share in these trainings too. Uh, and so, but that went on for a long time and I couldn't sleep and I was starting to feel desperate to get out of that hell realm that I was in, John. Mm. And I was starting to think about suicide. Although I was terrified of death, but it was like, at least it'll be over, hopefully. And one fateful day, there was a, on her bookcase there, our family was never religious. Me going into this, I was an atheist. I was an Ayn Rand uh, objectivist, you know, and all of a sudden yeah. stuff happened, opened the world to me, this underworld I didn't know existed. So I, st this little volume there, I pulled it out, little thin thing I'd never looked at before and opened it up. It was a kind of a fract and I opened it up and it said, the words popped out and just my eyes went through it says, come on to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that word rest, it was just like something touched me on the forehead. It was like, it was that, that kind of rest was like rest for your torment, rest for your spirit. Mm. Uh, it was out of the New Testament. Those were Jesus's words. I'm not proselytizing here. Here, I'm not a Christian, per se. I'm more of, I guess, It just went strange. into your soul. You know, the whole... The, the the message of it just hit you the message of it the message of it said in so many words whatever you're going through there is love in the universe that is that is at least just as strong that's what i felt and for the first time in weeks i was able to sleep because that when i would sleep the terror would come over me and grab me and kind of like that sleep paralysis you ever had that it's really bad. And and then it, it, it just started to ease. And so I, I just felt like, okay, there's a loving presence in the world. I experienced this hellish stuff that I never knew existed. Oh, balancing it out is this loving care. There's actually that right there in my grandmother's eyes and her soft voice. And so from that day forward, I kind of, I didn't know it, but I had my vacation, vacation. God, I wish. Okay. Vocation. <laughs> vocation grabbed me by the neck. No vacation. No that was it's been, it's been no vacation. It's been like old Young talks about a demon hat daemon. It feels like a demon too. A daemon, whatever that is, you know, it gets us yeah. as our life. Yeah. It controls what we have to do. Anyway, after that, I came out of that uh terror, supercharged terror, quite rapidly and was able to sleep. Gratefully, too, not long after that. At the college library, all this stuff, you know, I think there are, is synchronicity in like kind of unseen hands. I ran across the collected works of Jung there. I'd never heard of him before. Anyway, here, here it is in psychology. I, mean, I pull out this, all these, you know, those books. They're about, take up about five feet in the library shelves. I pulled one out. And it was, uh, I think the one, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was about Ion. It was the, the, about the self and the mithric god I anyway I opened it up and as soon as I started reading that I realized oh here's another human being just by what he was saying and the way they entered just you know the between the lines and the, this guy is no stranger to part of something that I went through I really had that experience so I started devouring all of young stuff yeah. then I started reading R.D. Lang and then from that I was able to get back into school and get my degree and, and I was and, never kind of and Michael your right. grandmother a, a very faithful person in your life really wasn't she just a, like the, the the depth of the wisdom and the love that you met Abs in someone like that absolutely that was I mean you know when you were talking about the factors that can take you make you vulnerable uh, to put it in variably, very horrible and unpoetic language, she was a big factor in going the other way. She was. And um, all those years when my mom was out kind of running wild and my sister and I were living with my grandmother and great-grandmother, she was like this rock. She was this pioneer woman that had come across. They'd lived in sod huts on the Nebraska Prairie. I mean, they were, these were strong women. 
Uh, so when my mom would come back from Las Vegas, wherever she'd been with her latest husband, I remember one time car pulled up unannounced, big red Cadillac, some old guy sitting there with a convertible with a cigar in his mouth, smoking my mom's latest husband. And she, she came up to the door and she says, you know, well, mother, I've come for the children. And my grandmother's standing there, John, and on the front porch with her arms over her chest like this going over my dead body. You know, so it's like all this stuff is is funny when I think about it, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's like most families have some of this drama in one way or the other, not necessarily like that. Yeah. So, yeah, my grandmother was, uh, you know, I don't know that I'd be here now without her. And so, but that, that essence of caring that we tried to bring to people at this iWord place. Let me talk a little bit about how all these programs, the iWord and Diabetes started. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and again, it starts a lot of this stuff out of suffering. There was this wonderful guy, Richard Price, who became the co-founder of the Eslin Institute. Some of your listeners have probably heard of that. It was the Big, Big Sur, Sur place started back in the... I've got no... You, you, when we were in Australia and you know other places in the world, I've got no idea where Big Sur is, but I've heard it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Eslin, yeah, it's on the Big Sur. It's south of San Francisco. It's on the incredibly rugged California coast. They didn't even have phone service down there until the 1950s. Right now... Yeah. It's, it's blocked off with the storms. You know, there's not going to be able yeah. to get through there for months, probably. So Dick Price had been this uh, wealthy son of a big corporate president here in, in, in the Midwest. And yeah. he went through his own travails and he got locked up for almost a year in, in a mental institution there. When he got out of there and kind of got it together, he moved. He came out here to the West Coast and met this, this guy, Michael Murphy, whose family owned that incredibly valuable property there on Big Sur where Esalen is. Yeah. And they started just because they were these explorers, started inviting some people uh, to come down there and, and, you know, have these times together. And it ended up, there was an immediately chemistry there with some people like Algis Huxley yeah. and, uh, and Alan Watts and, uh, mm. and some of these early, uh, you know, real, Joseph Strong. Campbell went down there, I think, didn't he? Oh, oh Campbell and and many, you many know, Fritz, well done, people. Fritz Pearls yeah. Gestalt ended up being in residence there. And John Perry, mm. uh, John Weir Perry, who was Young's heir apparent on psychosis. Mm. I know it's kind of bouncing around here, but maybe I just say something quickly about Perry. Because Perry's instrumental to this whole story in my life, too. Yeah. Uh, so John Perry was this. Uh, son of a patrician Anglican bishop of the United States in in the uh, in New England, and so uh, Perry was going to Harvard, and he was a he was a turned out to be a visionary. When he was at Harvard, he was studying all the latest physics and evolution and literature and everything. And he went out on a hillside uh, when he was a young man there at Harvard, and had this revelation. All those, he, said, he told me, all those different threads that he was studying kind of came together in his mind and in his heart. And he he, he saw this vision of, a, of like a globe encircling energy that evolution wasn't a dead end and uh, that humankind wasn't just fated for one chapter after another of wars and tyrants, that there was actually a possibility of an evolutionary divine love energy he later found out that the jesuit archaeologist uh, uh Teilhard de chardin had a similar vision of that called the news fair anyway perry had that vision and young's uh perry's father saw perry as kind of a dreamer he didn't know what to do with him so he was over in europe and he heard about young so he actually perry's father went to zurich and met, met with young and told him about john and young said well maybe john could, could be a a physician that would help ground him or something. A couple of years later, Young and Emma Young were coming to the United States to Harvard for Young to be honored as some centenarian thing or something. Yeah, and they were going to stay at, at at Perry's house, and so uh, Perry got dressed up and went down to pick them up at the train station, 
And then they went to this big event where Perry said there were all these luminaries there. There was Einstein and Jeanette and Janae or whatever, and all these people. Perry felt like, God, I'm just like an interloper. Anyway, he drove Jung and Emma back to their house, and he said Jung, he expected this Germanic uh, kind of dry scholar, but he was this big, boisterous, physical presence, laughing and carrying on and waving. And when they got to dinner that night uh, at the Perry house, Young was regaling the whole family there and everyone about, you know, myths and dreams and his work and everything. And then Perry that night had this fateful dream where uh, a Native American warrior in a loincloth and, a, and an ax tomahawk came running in and Perry was standing in the, the family living room and he threw this tomahawk right at yeah. Perry for his chest just before it's buried in his heart. Perry grabbed it like that with two hands. Yeah. And so the next morning, Perry said, told me, he said, well, I, you know, I thought I'd risk go telling this guy Jung about it because he's talking about dreams and all that. So he went and related this dream to Jung. And Perry said, Jung let out this whoop and said, yes, there it is, that wild man inside of you trying to get your attention. <laughs> so you know, that, my, my uh, if I can just come in for a second. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that story because. I don't know. Again, if I think about the Jung world, you know, how people try to wrap it up so neatly sometimes and, you know, oh, um, Carl Jung, the scientist or something and this and that and that. And, <laughs> and, but A, Jung being boisterous, a bit wild, reminds me a bit of D Dionysian, you know, in the sense of, and, and the wild man, you know, it's kind of like, there it is. It's all in that story. Yeah, and, and I don't I analyze going, people. Well, I, I don't analyze that. people's dreams, but I don't think it was any ex accident that that Jung, the wild man, might have germinated Perry's dream about the wild man, you know, and uh, about a wild man. But that was the beginning of Perry's connection with him was in 1932, right? And so then uh, John went to medical school, and uh, during the war his conscience directed him to become a conscientious objector and he joined the friends and friends ambulance corps and they went to china to serve the horrific amount of casualties that were being inflicted on the chinese population by the japanese invasion mm -hmm. and john told me when they got there it was just like they set up these field hospitals you know tents immediately started seeing people, but they were so overwhelmed that, you know, they were working 18 hours, 20 hours a day, just doing surgery and stopping wounds and everything. He said that every, a lot of the people got sick. And so he said he was, he was in charge of it. He said, so he, he had to make that difficult decision that they're going to triage people, people yeah. who had a chance to live, people who were going to die. And, yeah. and, 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 and then they weren't going to be, available 24 hours you know they were gonna to have to do it on shifts and everything he also told me that for some of the people the physicians and nurses that came over there just being in that chinese pre-industrial culture they weren't in the city they were out yeah he said because he'd never experienced anything like that either they go yeah. into a, a town and say we're going to send up a set up a hospital here to see your 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 people and the elders would just sit there and go we'll let you know and parents said, wait, no, now, we got to do it now. He goes, no. So he says, it was kind of like the, the living Taoist, the living kind of, and, and so he said, that culture shock of being in that kind of almost like back in the pre-industrial world tipped some of the, the, the friend's staff. He said they, they couldn't, couldn't handle it. It was too, it was like, yeah. it was like a psychedelic drug. They couldn't happen. It, and they, they, yeah. they lost it. They had to wrap mm. them up in sheets and send them back to the United States. So mm. anyway, after John he spent saw, years, he saw an enormous amount and, and experienced an enormous amount. Yeah. And, and, and just in that unusual culture mm. shock. And so John, after he went through that, he told me uh, after that, he, he, he lost all fear of death. It was just like when you're in that, it's just, he didn't go into all detail. He said, I, I just lost all fear of death because I was in it constantly for those years. So he came back 
to the states and uh he ended a friend up stri from, stri striking up a friendship with Jung, didn't he well a friend from harvard said you have an opportunity to go to zurich and be with young and you'd be a fool not to do it john was hesitating to do it but he got a rockefeller scholarship i think it was and went to be in zurich with young and of course young remembered him mm. and he offered John a unique thing I'd never heard of with anybody else before. He said, John, I want you to not be in analysis with me, but come and spend time with me every week or so. And we'll just sit here and talk about whatever we want to talk about. But I want you to be in a, in a dual analysis with Tony Wolf and uh, this other young male analyst, C.A. Meyer, Freddie Meyer. You be yeah. in this dual analysis with them and then go learn learn German from Marie Louise von Franz, you know. And so Perry was there with Jung during all that time. And um, I, well, uh, this story is kind of convoluted, but I, I ended up being in a close connection with Perry for about 20 years. He was my Jungian analyst starting in 1980 for four years. Then I did the research on his diaposis house. But during the course of all that, the main thing I got from Perry and what Perry said was the main thing he got from Jung and what I'd like to share with your audience that may be news to them. Yeah. Uh, because Jung never published it and Perry never published it. But Perry shared it with me. So I've mm. published it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but there's a reason for that, I think. So Jung said, Perry said the main, the most valuable thing that Jung shared with him in all those years was uh, a private dream teaching that Jung shared with John. And he said that Jung, Jung, Jung told John, for several years, I've had this nightmare of this menacing dragon coming after me in my dreams. And I'm terrified and I'm trying to get away and I can't get away and I'm trapped and I wake up in a cold sweat and I'm terrified of this dragon that's after me. And, I, and he said, and then one day I was in a reverie and the emotion, the terror that I was feeling when that dragon was after me in my dream I realized that that was the same, had the same quality of terror and menace every time my mother-in-law walked in the room. I know I shouldn't laugh, but I can't help. Well, it is, laugh. you know, it's, <laughs> you're waiting for some, you know, you know, <clears throat> wonderful mythological alchemical <laughs> reference, but no, that, so, so then Perry, Young told Perry, so that that is what please remember that the emotion that you feel in the dream that is in response to the image is of crucial importance mm -hmm. because it shows you what situation in your life if you look out in your life and see where that emotion resides. So if you have a dream, a nightmare, and there's a certain quality of fear, then you look out in your waking life and try and tune in to where that quality of fear is in your life. Then you'll have, know. Have you found this to be a very important thing for yourself and it, others? Yeah, it's, it's a central thing about not only dream stuff, but the whole uh, project of, 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 of of therapy and 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 how archetypes get constellated, but just to say a little more. So yeah. Jung said you can look out there and see what in your waking, your real life, is stirring up and constellating these archetypal forces in your unconscious, right? So there's this kind of feedback loop. There's a, there's this, this mirror reflective thing, and then you'll know because of the affect, the emotion in your unconscious that produced this image in other words and this is central to my work now and central to my teaching yeah it's the emotion that creates 
uh, creates, the, the, the image is created in whole cloth out of the emotion. Yeah. And so Jung had a very good reason to not publish that. And I think Perry did too. They didn't want to publish the fact that Jung was having dreams about his mother-in-law because everyone knew that Jung was having this relationship with Tony Wolf, his ex-patient, mm -hmm. and that Emma Wolf, Emma Young's mother, was very unhappy about her daughter being put through that public uh, shaming. I would say of her of of Young boldly. Uh, I've read that. I'm not sure the accuracy of that. The Young actually insisted that at least Tony Wolf wasn't welcome there in the house all the time, but at least on like on Sunday dinner, she would come and sit there at the table. So I'm not surprised that Jung didn't publish it. Yeah. Harry didn't publish it. And I'm sure most of your Jungian uh, listeners here, if they haven't read my article in Mad in America of all places called Dream Still the Royal Road to the Unconscious, where I, published Jung's yeah. personal secret dream teaching yeah that really is I've never seen anywhere else but what it is is like this this is how stuff happens you know this close relationship Perry had with him and mm -hmm. I'm not into gossip and oh I got you look well you know I've got the goods on somebody it's like these these can be valuable contributions to the understanding of things of the Jungian yeah. legacy uh, yeah. and what came out of this John was Perry then emphasizing he, he wasn't an emphatic kind of guy like this or this. He was just he would just tell me these things and hope that I, they were uh, landing and they did a lot of them. Anyway, a few years later, he kind of shocked the young in world who was paying attention to him that an archetype, he redefined what an archetype is. He, he refined it as an affect image. Yeah. For so long, the Jungian world, in my opinion, has been, and Jung too, has been so focused on the image. Mm. You know, the image, the symbol, the... That's an important thing to... The cre creation. <clears throat> but if, 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 if the, it's the emotion that mm. actually creates the image, then you have to look at it, the emotion, but guess what? Emotions are messy. Emotions may be lustful. They may be violent. They may be all, mm -hmm. be all kinds of things. So let's just, you know, I mean, there's one young guy, I forget his name, wrote a book called Emo Imagination is Reality. And as much as I love Hillman, he focuses so much on, on, on yeah. image and imagination too. It's like I, 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 I was know, thinking while you're talking that it's it's like there's different kinds of messages which are needed. Like I, I love the message about the imagination, you know, as, as in the sense that there's been that opening up to the image and, and Pacifica Graduate Institute and the imagination and all of that. But then uh, it's just one part of the big, of, 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 of a very big thing. Use the way well, what, what if it's it. what if it's not just one part? What if it's the creation of the emotion that created the image? That's what I'm saying, and that's I'm writing this book, and I'm really going to nail it when I put this yeah. in the book. Right. This is this is basically what Perry was saying when he redefined archetype, mm. and I've kind of taken that further in some of the writings I've done. There's a couple of them on emotion in that website, Mad in America, and again. This is what based on my to bring my forward. 28 years of being yeah. with people in extreme states. And I wrote one article, a reflection on 25,000 hours of mm. being face to face with people in extreme states. That's me, 25,000. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I believe and what came clear to me yeah. and was prompted by this, Perry redefining what an archetype is, is that actually developmentally, when we look at our species, if you take a young so-called human child and raise them away from any contact, 
they're never going to develop language. They're never going to develop. We're, we're, we're a species that with our big prefrontal cortex over time, over millennium, have been able to form the first word, then the first two or three words, and then the first sentence, and then yeah. the first idea, and having the images come up. But it, so I'll just lay it on the line here. Yeah. I believe that you watch a child develop language, but before they develop their first word, what are they? They're this little mammal, you know, everything they're expressing their emotional state, their full body emotional state. They cry, they laugh, they look afraid, they look uh, wide eyed, their, their body is all moving any way it wants to move. It's just, you know, mm. we're, we're these mammals that have created this ability to have words and sentences and thoughts and ideas and symbols and atom bombs growing out of that. And uh, but basically we're these emotional beings mm -hmm. that every word, every facial expression, yeah. you nodding your head this there, the every sentence, every idea, every image, every symbol is all arising out of that emotional world that emotional ex subjective experience. So if that's true, mm. then when I'm sitting here with someone who's in extreme state, I'm just sitting here sometimes for an hour or more without saying a word. Yeah. I'm sitting there, I'm saying to myself with my feet on the floor, this is the training I do at Esalen and other places. I'm mm. sitting here. The only thing that's happening for me is a little mantra in my head is going, I breathe in, wait for it. I breathe out, wait for it. What am I waiting for? The emotion to start to merge, emerge, and it'll form in words. And if you look at people who are going through these extreme states, their words don't make so-called sense, but their words are exquisitely reflective of the emotions they're going through. They're creating kind of their own metaphorical language of the emotions. So I'm sitting here breathing in, wait for it, wait for it. And as I wait for it, and it keeps emerging, it starts to have me in their world. And pretty soon, pretty soon, sometimes quicker than others, these threads start to form into motifs. And they, they start to be aware of themselves that what they're expressing is the emotion of fear, or the emotion of lust, or the emotion of sorrow. But waiting for it that way. I also, and I do this in these trainings with psychoanalysts and the Jungians. Yeah. We all have been trained and we have this black box. It's like a computer right next to us, but it's in our brain that yeah. we run everything through. We run, yeah. we, we, we see this experience, mm. we run it through there and we start talking about it. We start thinking about it. We start analyzing, we start yeah. problem solving. And that's a whole different experience. And if you're just sitting here, yeah. And I'm sitting here and I'm breathing in and I'm going, behold, and I breathe out, accept. Mm. Behold, accept. And when that happens, the person feels safe in a way that they don't when we're racking our brains, trying to come up with what's wrong with them, <laughs> trying to come up with I mean, how many marriages have failed because a man oh. can't keep his mouth shut? Well, honey, just wait a minute. I can tell you what's wrong. Uh, I've got I've got a solution to that problem you're telling me about, right? Yeah. It's a human thing. How much we crave yeah. Yeah, and love sure. to be re really listened to, really taken in without someone waiting yeah. to what I'm going to say next. You can tell yeah. when you're talking to someone, they're waiting. They're not really listening to you. They're just, they're just rehearsing what they're going to say next. Do you take that away and just be with someone? Then that emotion starts to come together. I'll just give a quick example for your audience. I think I've told you this story before, but I can make it quick. I got yeah. contacted from a family about a young man who had been in the system. He was about 20 years old, but he'd been in the system. He'd had one of these psychotic so-called breaks and gone in, and they'd given him the medication for two or three, four hospitalizations. They even gave him ECT once. The family 
decided this isn't working, this isn't helping. In fact, for the last three months, our son has been wandering around the house, hasn't made a complete sentence. He's disheveled, he's just in his own world, but we're not gonna put him back in the hospital because that hurts him more than what's going on now. So they contacted me and said, what can you do? Read some of my stuff, this, you know, this unorthodox way. I said, well, I don't know, just have him, uh, maybe tomorrow I'll just set up the computer there and I'll, I don't know what I can do, but I'll just be with him if he wants to mm. look at me and through the computer. So they set up the iPad on the table and then they went out of the room and he's in the room kind of wandering around mm. and he comes up and kind of glances at me and I said, hello, I'm Michael, nice to see you. And then he went away for about five minutes. Well, most people go, okay, five minutes, he's gone. Let's just, you know, suspend mm. this, but I just waited. Then came back, peaked again. Then he went away and about 10 minutes went by. I'm still sitting there. And then he comes back and he peeks in again for another a little longer, looks at me, then away. And me just sitting there, again in that place of just waiting, beholding, accepting what comes, unbidden from my emotional state that I was in, this caring for him, mm. like I would for someone that I really knew and cared about the words came up inside of me unbidden you are the apple of my eye i didn't speak those words to him but i was feeling the resonance of those words that emerged out of the emotion i was feeling mm -hmm. you are the apple of my eye and so he came back a few minutes later and looked in and then he really looked and he looked in and mm -hmm. kind of opened his eyes and looked in my eyes kind of like what you know who is this he's looking at me and i'm just sitting there with this look of like maybe my grandmother looking down at me, you are the apple yeah. of my eye. Mm. And then he went away for about 10 minutes. Then he came back in and he looks in and speaks the first words, first sentence he's made in three months and goes, so what do you get off on? <laughs> That's good. And I said, well, I really like to go down to the river here near where I live and it's watching it flow by and, I love the way it smells, you know, and I look up in the clouds and sometimes I hear birds and, and I said, I really like to meet new people. And he didn't say anything. He just went away. The hour's about up. The parents have been eavesdropping. Obviously the door, they opened the door. He went in the other room. They came in and said, wow, that's the first sentence he's made in, in three months. And thank you. I said, well, yeah. why don't we meet tomorrow and see what happens? So later that night, John, I got a text from the mother. Well, he's up running around the house naked, talking a mile a minute. Yeah. And I, I texted back. I said, well, that might be progress. So the next day, comes back, sets up the iPad. Parents go out of the room. He takes the iPad and puts it on the floor. On the floor, so it's the screen is, you know, facing the ceiling. So I'm, it's like I'm, on my back staring at the ceiling right all of a sudden when well, he goes away for a while and then he comes back and starts dropping little pieces of paper and trash and stuff on the screen so he's like he's burying me alive down there i'm laying here i'm looking at, in the screen and it's being covered and i hear him walking around and he completely covers it no light getting through at all and then he goes away for about 10 or 15 minutes he wasn't sitting there consciously. I'm going to test this guy to see what he does. But I'm still in that place of kind of like, you're in the apple of my eye. And so then finally, about 30 minutes into this, I see a finger come in and start to separate this stuff out. And he pulls it back out and I'm, and I'm still there. I mean, there again, that waiting, like a mm -hmm. midwife, just waiting. And... So he completely unearths me, puts the laptop up on the table, then sits down and looks at me and goes, um, so did you ever see that Coen Brothers movie, Raising Arizona? I said, yeah, I saw that. I really liked that. He goes, yeah, me too. I said, uh, did you ever see that Coen? I asked him, did you ever see that Coen Brothers movie, Oh Brother, How, Where Art Thou? He goes, yeah, that's one of my favorites too. So we started having this conversation about these movies. Mm. And so after that, it's just, I was meeting him every couple of days, 
he started bringing in some poetry that he'd written. He had his guitar. We were talking and stuff. And it just grew from that. And I stressed to the parents, please find someone in the community there, a real person that he can maybe connect with. And they fortunately found a wonderful young woman who was the so-called case manager in the mental health system who came out and met with him. And he was ready then to like engage with someone because me doing that thing, and I'm, it's, anyone can do that. That's that's what I train at these excellent thing at the APA. And I'll, it's like, all you got to do is <laughs> kind of forget everything you learned. Just sit there and be with someone in that place waiting like you would at the bedside of a beloved who's injured or uh, someone you love, just, you know, you, you give mm-hmm. that to them. Uh, so he kind of started coming out of it and started going to the park and playing basketball, pick up games with this young girl. It wasn't, you know, three weeks later, we were having a family meeting with his younger sister and his brother who zoomed in from Europe. And we're, you know, so he, me kind of going into his world. Yeah. And he, he was feeling safe and some comfort. Like I was, Harmlessly yeah. helpful. I love that term that Lang used. Harmlessly helpful. I, yeah. I, I wasn't going to do anything to him. I wasn't. I was just waiting to be with him. And so, anyway, I just want to give that example to their it's, audience. It's, that it's, you know, uh, pow- it's powerful, Michael. I'm conscious of one thing. We, we're starting to go way over, but I don't think we like. That is such a powerful story and so much of what you've added and shared and given and everything is very powerful. And, you know, I'm wondering whether maybe we can continue the conversation sometime because probably you might have left some things out. You know, there's other avenues as well. But I just think that story is such a, um, I don't know, just such a poignant and powerful way to finish too, you know, in, in, in terms of an approach. Thank you, John. I'd love to see you again and just say quickly that that approach, a lot of that came out of my experience with John Perry and yeah. what he did at, Di- at the Jungian Diabasis House, where th- the main results of my research I did on that, that there is a way of being with people. And this is the way. Yeah. John called it love, called it loving receptivity. And so in terms of the Jungians out there, his Diabasis House proved what Jung's intimations were about psychosis that people can go through this and come out the other side maybe let, next time we talk i can tell you the audience a lot more about diabetes house if you want thanks very much and thanks for um thanks for all of that sharing michael you're welcome okay